Uh, much of our work here at the Center for Ethical Business Cultures is focused on building ethical cultures inside of organizations, really understanding values and understanding how to embed those values in the day-to-day -day work of the organization and of the business. Uh, but we also focus on corporate responsibility, which sometimes, depending on what organization you're talking to, have a different label, corporate citizenship, corporate social responsibility, corporate responsibility, sustainability, you know, it kind of goes on and on, but you realize after listening to that, they're all talking about some of the same sorts of things. And that moves us into the question of how a company projects its internal values and its understanding of who they are and its own purpose in its relationships with external uh, stakeholders, if you will, beyond the formal bounds of the organization itself. So this lens of responsibility uh, invites us up and down a product life cycle in a business, throughout a business, to examine the company's values and performance as it intersects with these external stakeholders and the broader society. I think the Hershey Company provides us with an interesting as well as a unique story uh, that speaks to these issues. Hershey is one of America's iconic brands. Y you and I all grew up with it. Uh, our parents grew up with the Hershey brand. Probably our grandparents grew up with the Hershey brand. Uh, and we all recognize, I should say we all recognize some of your brands because we don't associate some of them with the company. But we'll, he'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it is one of North America, it is North America's leading manufacturer of quality chocolate, non-chocolate confectionery, and chocolate-related grocery products. But the company also has a unique sense of, of purpose and it's a unique organizational and governance structure that uh, Andy will tell you about. I think the third point I would make about Hershey, that along with many other businesses, whether it's in the chocolate and confectionery uh, sector or in other sectors of the economy, all of our businesses face difficult challenges uh, up and down the supply chain and into the distribution side of, of the business that relate to any number of issues. Uh, in particular with Hershey, there's issues around uh, sourcing cocoa in West Africa, and uh, Andy's going to talk a little bit about that, but also issues here in the U.S. around obesity and health and nutrition. So I am delighted that we have Andy with us. Uh, he is the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Hershey Corporation. Uh, in, his, in this role, he's uh, Hershey's lead in communications, public relations, and corporate social responsibility. Uh, his key responsibilities include external and internal communications, development and implementation of a global framework for social responsibility and sustainability, uh, and that includes responsible cocoa sourcing, uh, largely in West Africa. His CSR responsibilities have led him to serve on the boards of the World Cocoa Foundation, the International Cocoa Initiative, and the United Way of Lancaster County. Andy joined Hershey from Pfizer, where he was Vice President for Worldwide Communications, and before joining Pfizer, he held positions with IBM and daily newspapers in Virginia and Wilmington, Delaware. Notably, Andy was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana, and I think that gives him some unique perspectives on the business of sourcing as well in West Africa. He lives with his wife and daughter in Littitz, uh, just outside Lancaster and near Harrisburg in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I would ask you um, to extend a warm welcome. Uh, oddly enough, when he came here, he wanted to experience a Minnesota winter. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> um, so despite the fact that we are not able to deliver a genuine Minnesota winter, I was tempted to put a photo of the stop sign outside my house up, which had like six feet of snow around it last year. I would like you to welcome Andy McCormick. Uh, good afternoon, and a Minnesota spring will work just as well. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, fellow panelists. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I was here once in Minnesota about 25 years ago on a bicycle trip, and we were camping near Bemidji, and the mosquitoes were so awful that we ended spending the night standing in a phone booth just to get away from them. <laughs> so this is much more pleasant. 
Um, advance through the slides I was supposed to use. So oh. Just keep going. <laughs> um, there's another saying uh, that our salespeople tell me when they're making uh, account calls. It's, uh, you've probably heard this, but you have to listen to the sermon to get to the choir. And what <clears throat> that means with this presentation is there will be chocolate afterwards, so you do have to pay attention. <laughs> Um, we, are, uh, uh, we are 112, 13 years old, uh, and I noticed that uh, you all were started in 1885, so if you think about it, we're both in our third century of sustainability. And I would say the theme of today's talk, if there is one, is that uh, going back to what you're about from the beginning is really re relevant today, uh, even as we grow globally, even as we source cocoa from Indonesia and Africa and so forth. So I think our story is that Mil <coughs> Milton Hershey's uh, perspective on the world as an innovator uh, and as a philanthropist is still very relevant, and, and hopefully you'll see the connection. Um, I want you to meet Oscar. Oscar's um, a cocoa farmer in Ghana, in central Ghana. And um, Oscar is interesting for two reasons. Uh, number one, he works near um, Ghana's uh, model cocoa growing. He works for the government trying to grow better varieties of cocoa. But he also, as you see, has a cell phone. And um, we were up trying to explain our new cell phone program to Oscar. And he said, I really don't have time to talk to you guys. I'm on the phone. So, you know, things are ch changing quickly. It's really a great time. There's a lot of innovation in social responsibility. There's a lot of willingness to partner. And I think that will be a theme that hopefully we hear from the rest of us, that the public-private partnerships you hear about are real. They're making a difference. There's a long way to go. But you, you'll, you'll see the uh, possibilities of change here with people like Oscar being involved. Um, so Milton Hershey, uh, I'm from Lancaster, Milton Hershey, uh, Pennsylvania. He, he was from a Mennonite, his mother was a Mennonite. He, as you may know, failed at three or four businesses before making his breakthrough. Um, in that era, you really didn't go bankrupt. It was a social stigma. Uh, but he, <clears throat> he persevered and he ushered in sort of mass chocolate. Um, he's, a, he's a fascinating guy, but uh, one of the things he really did not like to do was talk about himself or talk about his company. He preferred that words or actions speak louder than words. So while we uh, will be talking here, I'll be talking about what we're doing, we try to approach these things with a great deal of modesty. We know that many other companies are doing a lot of work, great work, uh, and I just want to say this is a Hershey perspective. We don't pretend it's different or better than anyone else's, but it's unique to us. Um, he is very much a presence in our company and in Pennsylvania, and we think he's uh, as relevant as ever. Um, <clears throat> you probably know the company principally through its products. The signature product is the Hershey bar. That goes back to, the, to Milton Hershey's uh, first product. Uh, our biggest product is the Reese's peanut butter cup. That's our first billion dollar brand. Um, and. Um, the, the linkage to these products is, by and large, they come from West Africa. So we buy about 60% of our cocoa beans from West Africa. We also source from um, Indonesia uh, and some from Latin America. But um, there is a strong connection between the company's uh, fortunes and products and the cocoa villages that I'll be talking about. Um, this is a uh, business presentation. We, we really don't think of sustainability except as a core business function. Uh, it is part of what we do, and so I wanted to give you a sense of the company overall before we delve into the particulars on the CSR program. So we're doing pretty well these days. This shows our uh, net sales uh, are growing. Um, confectionery has been um, uh, pretty recession resilient. Uh, people go back to brands like Hershey during tough times. So we, we've, we've uh, done well during difficult times. 
Um, we have uh, focused on the core products that you saw. We've increased our television advertising. And uh, we are reinvesting now to grow globally. Hershey's about 85% domestic, North America, 15%. And we think over the next 10 years, we can get to something more like 70 and 30. So we are going to be growing from our North American base. Um, and um, we, we have four targeted uh, markets. That would be Brazil, China, and India. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, we have increased our spending, particularly on television. Um, there has been some questions about whether television is still the right channel for these big brands, but uh, so far in the last couple of years, it's worked very well for us. Um, the larger point um, to think about in chocolate is the growing middle class in China, India, and Brazil will be consuming more chocolate products. Uh, you can see a direct linkage between GDP growth and chocolate consumption. As, as people have more money, this is something that they want. So one of the storylines here is that for the African countries and for the cocoa producers, it really is an excellent opportunity to uh, expand their exporting. Uh, but um, there are challenges to that that we'll be talking about. Um, just uh, uh, our great customers like Target and, and Walmart um, need us to be innovative, need us to bring uh, new innovations, and I just want to list a couple of them. We also stay, have to stay active with our consumers, and um, I'd like to show you a couple of advertisements that are running to give you a sense of um, how the consumers see our products. I have to go to the next one. Oops. They're really great ads. a few more of those, but you get the idea. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some announcements we've made recently, a couple weeks ago, uh, relating to uh, what we are uh, stepped up uh, outreach in West Africa. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I'm going to talk in some depth about a program that we call Coco Link. It's a mobile phone uh, program designed to increase the productivity of the cocoa farmers. Uh, but we also, for the first time, are going to uh, use uh, Rainforest Alliance to uh, provide certified cocoa to a major Hershey product, uh, which is Bliss. Uh, we're also expanding the mobile phone product, uh, uh, in, uh, project into the Ivory Coast, which is the world's number one producer of, uh, of cocoa. And then um, 
I think the, the, the fourth one is called the Hershey Learn to Grow Farm Center. For the first time, we're going to have a farm uh, in, uh, in central Ghana. Uh, and that will do two things. That will be where we grow some of the certified cocoa. We'll work uh, through partners, NGO partners, with the community on a school and a farmer education program. Um, and all of this is designed to do two things, increase uh, better lives in the cocoa communities uh, and um, take a, uh, a co comprehensive uh, approach to a really tough problem of child labor, which I'll talk more about. So uh, that was uh, a, a milestone announcement for us. Um, and um, the reception has been very strong, actually. We, 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 we have been on the receiving end of tough criticism from the activists. Um, and uh, the, in general, the response to, to our new initiative has been quite, uh, quite favorable. Oops. <laughs> That's kind of sad. Um, now, uh, this is a pretty interesting slide. You could sort of think about Milton Hershey as kind of a, the Bill, a Bill Gates type guy. Uh, he, around 1917, he gave, gave away $60 million, which was, it's probably, a, I don't know, a billion or two today. It was his entire fortune. He gave it to the Milton Hershey School. Um, and the interesting story was that um, he wrote the check and five years later, a reporter for the New York Times came across this in a public filing and, you know, called Milton Hershey and said, uh, is it, did you give away $60 million? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, how come nobody knows about it? And Milton Hershey said, well, nobody asked. <laughs> so uh, out of that $60 million, you now have a, uh, a $8 billion endowment for the Milton Hershey School in Pennsylvania, which has 2,000 um, students and is probably one of the top five schools for disadvantaged children in the country. Uh, but you see all these other entities, and we, the Hershey Company, is right there. So we are owned by the school trust. They, uh, uh, they have about 75% of the stock under their control. The stock is publicly traded. The stock has gone up 30 or 40 percent in the last couple of years, if you're interested. Um, but we also own the amusement part. We don't own the, the, the Milton Hershey Company, the entertainment company owns the Hershey Park, if you've been there. So that's kind of the legacy of Milton Hershey. Oops. Um, so how do, we, how do we operationalize that in today's world? Uh, about a year and a half ago, we formalized the social responsibility work that we had been doing in pockets of the, uh, of the uh, uh, company, not, un not dissimilar to a lot of other Fortune 500 companies. The key words here are uh, uh, children, communities, and consumers, the three C's. So that's how we delineate what we're going to invest in, what we're going to focus on. So work in Africa ultimately uh, aims at, at the children there. Those are kind of how we view the world. Uh, within the, within the uh, company, uh, we have 13,000 employees, and it's really not a stretch to say that virtually all of them are engaged in this kind of work. Whether they know there's a company strategy or not, they're, um, they're very committed to uh, the, the profit beyond purpose beyond profit. Um, and this is kind of how we operationalize it. Uh, it's the perfect uh, uh, equilibrium between a board and uh, CEO-led vision and a bottoms-up strategy. You have to have both, uh, otherwise you don't get the uh, synergy that you need. Uh, I want to spend some time now on cocoa farming. Um, how many have you? How many of you have been to Africa? And where? How many have been to Latin America? Yeah. So this is, um, you know, this is rural agriculture. Uh, it is um, a a uh, family farm. It's five to ten acres. There are not big cocoa farms. There's not much mechanization. There's hardly any mechanization. So it's largely grown and harvested as it was uh, 60 or 70 years ago. There, 
There really hasn't been a lot of uh, change to basic processes. One of, the, one of the ways I try to explain this in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure it's true here, the corn farmers would create about 40 bushels an acre 50 years ago. And today they're pushing almost 140. So you see that incredible change in productivity. Well, the farmer here really isn't experiencing any gain like that. It's more or less as it's been. So the big challenge um, for the farmer is to uh, increase uh, production on the farm. Cocoa is a very sensitive crop. It really can only be uh, grown in these conditions that you see, high humidity, right around the, uh, uh, right around the equator. And um, they have the same pressures that uh, on land and land usage and population growth and urbanization. So it's actually rather a fragile crop. And as I said earlier, with the world eating more chocolate, there's definitely a need to be uh, more efficient and more productive. Uh, the Hershey Company has a relatively uh, simple strategy that took about 30 years to put together. And the reason for that is on, everybody has been trying pretty hard to improve this, but it just hasn't gotten critical mass. I think that's going to change. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, better outcomes for the farmer means more wealth for the farmer's family, means more children can go to school. That improves the social conditions. For us, we think it helps uh, uh, improve our supply and frankly addresses an area where we have been criticized for not doing enough. Um, our friends at Cargill can probably speak better to this, but there has been um, a sort of a, a flat period here in cocoa production. A big, a big problem has been the uh, crisis in the Ivory Coast, the political, civil unrest. So Ivory Coast has had its problems. There hasn't been enough investment in the last 10 years. We think that will change, but that will take a while. So um, for, the, uh, for the analytical minds in the room, it's a pretty simple problem to write down on one slide. You have Indonesian, Malaysia, two or, th two or three fold more productive than the, the Ghanaian and the uh, Ivorian farmer. So to make a dent in the overall change in the equation, you have to get these farms to be more productive. So if you can go from three or 400 to 1,000, that's, that's doable. And, and that's what we're all kind of working toward. As, I, as I've been saying, it's not like we woke up yesterday and figured this out. It's been well known for a long time when we were putting our social responsibility report out, we found out that we had been sending teachers from Elizabethtown College into West Africa 50 years ago. So there's been a lot of commitment. I don't think it's been scalable enough, and I think that with the technology and, and more corporate commitment, um, we are going to see a change. So a year ago, well, a, a personal story. I, I was in the Peace Corps in Ghana in the early 80s, and I hadn't been back. And uh, when I started with Hershey, um, I went with one of our cocoa buyers back to Ghana. When I, had, when I was there, it was very poor. It was, uh, there had been a coup, there wasn't any fuel, even worse, there wasn't any beer. So uh, <laughs> it was really hard. Um, but I went back 25, three or four years ago, 25 years later, and it's a changed society. It's growing, it's flourishing, it's a democracy, it's vibrant. There's still a lot of poverty, but, but it's a, a generational sea change. And one of the things I noticed that even when we went into the rural villages, the chiefs would have a cell phone or the, the farmers. So I said to my colleagues, well, why don't we take this great learning that we're doing village by village? And they go into the, it's called farmer field schools, and they're excellent, but you can only in a good year reach 2,000 people. So why don't you take all that great curriculum, <coughs> curriculum and deliver it through the cocoa link, through a, through a cell phone. Really pretty simple idea. And um, we've been very pleased with it. And I want to tell you about how it works and how we got there. So um, the headline is correct, from no phone to cell phone in three years. You see the data here where um, the landlines, they didn't make, they didn't, they wanted to, but they didn't have the capital to make 
the telecommunications investment that you need. So you just see in, in a few years that they've had this revolution in telecommunications. You also see Ghana being the lead. I personally think that's their culture and that's their <coughs> democratic state. So very open to um, uh, communications. So again, really no different than how these, these cell phones affect our lives in this country. I don't really know how to use a cell phone, but uh, um, they're really uh, a powerful tool. The, the vision we have is that pretty soon, Oscar will be able to take a picture of a disease tree, will be able to send it to the, to the CRIG, the, the research institute, in the same day get an answer what that disease is. And you can imagine Oscar is two or three day walk out from a village. That's really a game changer. It's all in the local language and um, there's a lot of training involved which I'll get to. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we're in the programs in western, western Ghana in the, in the Cocoa region. Um, you can't really just throw something like this into, the, into rural Ghana. And the reason we chose this is because we've been investing through uh, USAID in um, education programs. So the villages, we have 15 target villages. They have trainers that have, they've selected. They select a lead farmer. Uh, and so we felt confident that they would be the right place to start um, really a viral network. So the idea is very simple. You, you train the lead farmers and you incent them to sign up their, friend, <coughs> their friends. Uh, the good news is about 70% of the farmers already have cell phones. They're not smartphones, they're cell phones, but they work just fine. And um, uh, our partners, World Education, are really expert in delivering um, local information in a relevant way. Uh, you can't, you shouldn't, you don't want to do these things by yourself. So, uh, you, you know, you just have to build a lots of partnerships. The, the two that are kind of interesting to me are Oval Productions, it's called Dream Oval. It's a small Ghanaian software firm, probably didn't exist three years ago, <clears throat> but they're great. They're, they know exactly how to run the technical side of it. And then the Ghana Cocoa Board. Um, the premise of this program is it will last for three years and then they will own it. We will get out of the business. It goes to them. So the incentive to them is to participate, to build it with us, and then they have a product to reach their cocoa farmers. Now, what do I do? <laughs> That's a very sophisticated technology presentation. Oh. Is, um, is basically a mobile technologies-based program, um, and it utilizes um, technology which sends out text messages and voice messages um, to um, anybody who has registered onto the network, onto the platform. Since the text messages are going out not only in English, but also in the local language, this enables the farmers to thus engage much more and be able to read the messages that go out to them. I see it as a tool which in Ghana's case, the Ghana Cocoa Board can really utilize it to mobilize farmers, um, to not just produce better cocoa, but to enable them to live better lives. Uh, so that's uh, kind of what we're doing in, in, in West Africa and Cocoa. I'm just going to briefly cover off some of our other social responsibility work. Um, we, uh, we have learned the insightful lesson that when we start communicating about what we do and we listen to folks, we learn a lot. So uh, we, we, we have a social responsibility report. We have a formal program of engaging with all kinds of stakeholders. 
And almost every time we do that, we learn something really interesting, uh, really important. One of the most interesting ones recently is with one of our suppliers, and they're not in this room, so I won't name them, uh, but they're, uh, they're using GPS to map uh, cocoa farms in, in the Ivory Coast. And that's pretty amazing because most of the farmers think they have 10 acres and they only have five, or they think they have five and they really have 10. And that has all kinds of really interesting uh, impacts on how much fertilizer and, and supplies they buy. So uh, again, we're in, we're in continuous learning mode. Uh, an area of, of interest uh, with consumers around the world is health and wellness. At the far end of that is obesity. At the front end is uh, fitness. And we're trying to uh, both communicate what we're doing about uh, responsibility and, and in nutrition as well as some of the product offerings we're growing. Um, we have, uh, this year we'll be celebrating the 35th anniversary of our track and field games. It's the largest youth activity program um, and uh, we we're very proud of this program. It's very simple. It doesn't cost any money. It's local run track and, and field events uh, in the winters. Uh, 400 kids come to Hershey each uh, summer to s celebrate that. Oops. Um, give you back one. The next pillar is the environment. Uh, we, for the first time, worked on the carbon disclosure project in 2009. Uh, we came in there. Um, uh, I think that was our first year. It was a very serious piece of work. It, uh, it teaches us a lot um, and we're committed to it so that will be part of our sustainability reporting uh, going forward. Um, in the workplace we have a, a, a really terrific sales force um, and in each of our regional uh, offices there is a salesperson who about 10 percent of their time is related to CSR so that could be Habitat for Humanity volunteer initiatives. They coordinate with our headquarters uh, office. Um, they had a, uh, like other companies, uh, when we have sales meetings, uh, last year they were in New Orleans and they did a rebuild day. So they really find this kind of uh, engagement to be uh, good for the team and good for the community. Um, so we're getting close to the chocolate uh, uh, portion, but again, coming back to Milton Hershey, this is from a, a guy who was the headmaster of the Milton Hershey School, and I thought it was a good, uh, sort of a good sound bite. Commerce with compassion, and um, really, when you when you apply that in the real world today, there's a lot of interesting things that can happen. So the first woman said that, you know, I'm not literate. I can't read. And we said, well, why would you sign up for this program? She said, well, my children can read. And um, this guy is what you would call an early adopter. He just wants information. He's an entrepreneur. He knows what he needs to do, and, and, and he'll apply it, and he'll um, you know, <clears throat> increase his family income quite considerably. Um, at the end of the day, we are uh, uh, suppliers to the operating income of the Milton Hershey School. It's a unique uh, American institution. Um, it was set up as an orphanage. Today we have about 2,000 students, uh, uh, disadvantaged students. About 33 states are represented uh, at the school. And I wanted to show you just a little uh, video about the school, if I can. Hershey was, I think, a loving, caring guy. Well, he couldn't have any kids. He gave all his fortune just to build a school. Where he could help children in need. It's way more than a school. It gives you a place to live. A home. It's everything. It made a difference in all of our lives. This school helped thousands of kids. Thousands and thousands of kids that don't have as much as other people. To have a good education and 
do something great when they grow up. It changed my whole life, practically. It gives a lot of people a second chance if they come from a neighborhood that's not where they should be. When you come here, it feels like you're in a new world. I feel safe here. I feel better about myself. I feel that I'm important. Dollars. They care about you. They love you here. Like all these kids, like you have your own kids, but you just love them like they're your own. I love it here. I love you too. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we do feel like we're making progress. Um, you know, we, we learn as we go. Uh, but I w would like to say that um, social responsibility at our company is really part of what we do. It's very relevant. I think it helps us with our business partners. It's certainly a powerful tool for the employees. We're seeing more and more people coming uh, to want to work for us uh, because of this. So. Uh, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions later on. Thank you very much, Andy. I'm Ron James. I'm with the Center for Ethical Business Cultures and we're just delighted with the stage that you've set talking about the responsibility of business, even beyond the bottom line. Clearly a number of companies have done well within their own local communities as the last part of your presentation showed. But what happens when you have a network of relationships beyond the local community? What's the responsibility of business in that space? We want to continue that conversation by asking um, three different points of views to be shared. One of the missions we have at the center is to really create a forum whereby we can listen to different lens on different topics. What does the academic community have to say? What does the not-for-profit, non-governmental organization community have to say? And what does business have to say? I'm going to invite our panelists to please join me at the table here, and I will introduce them. We'll ask them to make comments. Um, Jim Harkness, who's being seated, uh, is president of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy here in Minneapolis. IATP works locally and globally at the intersection of policy and practice to ensure fair and sustainable food, farm, and trade systems. Before he joined IATP in July of 2006, he served as the executive director of the World Wildlife Fund in China between 1999 and 2005. His focus, he really expanded the organization's profile from a strict focus on con conservation to one of addressing the consequences of China's economic growth on a broader sustainable development agenda. He also was heavily involved with the Ford Foundation and its initiatives in the environment, and he was a development program officer for China uh, and an advisor to the World Bank. Next to Jim is Mark Murphy. Mark is the Assistant Vice President of Corporate Affairs a director of corporate responsibility and the executive director at Cargill's foundation. In these capacities, Mark really serves as Cargill's global lead for all of the company's corporate responsibility practices. He provides leadership for cross-geography corporate teams addressing economic, environmental, and social challenges in, communi in communities where Cargill operates. He also focuses on themes of sustainability, looks at sourcing, responsible sourcing, food security and food safety, as well as Cargill's relationships with its non-governmental organization, organizational partners. Next to Mark is Christopher Michelson. He's an assistant professor here at the University of St. Thomas in the Opus College of Business. His teaching and research have really been in the area of meaningful work as a central concern of business ethics. He's used the arts and literature and film to explore work values in rebalancing a global economy. Previously, he taught at New York University's Stern School of Business and at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. For several years, he's also combined his love for teaching in academic settings, though, with business practice as a risk manager and corporate responsibility advisor 
with Price Waterhouse Coopers. That's where he began his professional career in New York City. He earned his PhD in philosophy here in Minnesota. Please join me in welcoming our three panelists. We've asked each of them to take about five to seven minutes to share their insights, and then we'll be back to you and invite your questions into the conversation. Jim? Thanks very much. I'd first of all just like to thank the Center for Ethical Business Cultures. It's really a pleasure and an honor to have an opportunity to um, be here in this conversation. Um, I, I really appreciated Andy's remarks and, and wish we had a couple of days to to dive into um, some of the different uh, uh, strands of, of what he touched on. I, th I think that um, everything from the, the business culture aspect of it, where does, where does change and where do initiatives for social responsibility come from within business and how do they move forward? Um, the, the relationship to markets, you know, there's Mars is out there and Cadbury's out there and, and how do those um, economic but also uh, uh, even collegial relationships affect the way that these kind of initiatives move forward, the speed and the, the nature of them. Um, and then of course there's that larger ecosystem that includes civil society and non-governmental organizations like my own that are also out there with their views. Um, and I've, I've been uh, on staff of, of, uh, of groups that take a variety of different approaches as part of that ecosystem. There are, there are the constructive engagers uh, like WWF that might work very closely um, uh, to, to try to come up with things like codes of conduct uh, and voluntary systems. Um, there are more campaigning organizations um, like some of the ones that have been uh, putting pressure on, on Hershey's. Um, and, and how from a corporate perspective, uh, people like Andy make those decisions about who do you, who, who do you talk to and under what conditions um, are, are really fascinating. And I know from my time at WWF that, um, uh, that it's a real risk for both sides to have those kinds of conversations. And so uh, for me, that's, that's quite fascinating. Um, b before coming uh, today, I had a chance to look at Hershey's uh, scorecard, their CSR scorecard. And so I think I would just briefly say that, you know, thinking about what you've told us about um, the initiatives in, in Ghana and, and West Africa and the scorecard, I think that a couple of things that I really appreciate are, um, first of all, that, um, you know, Hershey's is setting some, uh, some targets for yourself, that this is not... Um, uh, this is not a, 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 a vague set of promises, but there are actual hard targets that are set and, and the performance against those targets is measured. So I think that that's, that degree of transparency is, is something that uh, is very positive. When we look at CSR efforts, it's something that we always uh, keep an eye out for. Um, uh, the other thing that I, that I like about it is this notion of um, continuous progress, that we all have to start from somewhere. It, it should never be seen as, CSR should never be seen as a, an all or nothing uh, prospect, as it sometimes appears um, from the outside. And so um, looking at, at what Hershey's is doing in West Africa, again, uh, not, a, not a deep educated view, but based on today's presentation and, and a little bit of uh, research, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like the, the work with growers to increase productivity uh, is important. Um, and, and for me, that's a first step. In many ways, that's just good business, right? I mean, if, if Cargill provided uh, agricultural extension to corn and soy farmers to grow more corn and soy, we wouldn't necessarily say that's corporate social responsibility. Um, but it's a good business practice and it's a way of understanding your producers better. Um, I, I think that the, the step of, of moving to third-party certification, um, even of one line uh, of products, is a really important and difficult one um, for which Hershey's is to be commended. Anytime you're inviting outsiders in, 
uh, to your corporate processes and letting them peek behind the curtain and see how your supply chains work um, and make an independent assessment of how you perform according to different sustainability criteria. That, that is a huge step and I think that um, that's uh, really going to be interesting to watch how that proceeds and, and how Hershey's can learn from that and move forward. I think the next step to think about um, and the one that farmers really care about, of course, is price. Um, because producing more at a time when the market is improving means you get more. Uh, but we're in a global situation today where markets are extremely volatile. Um, and so without some sort of price guarantee or uh, some sort of power to bargain in the marketplace to secure a better price, um, just improving productivity really does, has no necessary connection to improving livelihoods um, as opposed to just improving supply. So I think from our perspective that's sort of where we see uh, the process right now and it's really exciting to have an opportunity to um, listen and learn and, uh, and I look forward to seeing what the next steps are that Hershey's is going to take. Thanks. Well, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, Andy, it was, a, it was really a pleasure to sit and watch your presentation. Uh, I have a few colleagues in the room, and I think they would agree with me that there, there are words on your slides and experiences as in your business that could almost be carried right over to cargo with a complicated ownership system. Um, certainly, uh, that, 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 that's too unique. Um, but you talked about some really key areas, and, and I'm going to just try to touch on three sort of broad areas in, in my remarks because I was asked to sort of respond and react to what you said. So I'll talk a little bit about the Cargill Hershey piece. Um, I want to talk about this concept of market transformation because I think that's really what's going on today uh, that we're certainly faced with as a company, a global company, and we work with a lot of consumer goods and food and retail companies in our business certainly and feeling that pressure. And they'll give you a few examples of cargo because what Hershey described in their cocoa supply chain, we are experiencing in many supply chains. Um, and so we've seen it, we're experiencing it, we're doing these kinds of things. But on the Hershey side, I think a um, couple of high level comments. You could clearly see the deep seated roots of your values. Um, Cargill, 150 year old company, and we carry around stamped on our shoulders, our word is our bond. It was said by our early owners and it, we carry it through today. So ethics is deeply seated in company values and I think many of us who might be cynics about the private sector, those are deeply rooted in a lot of companies. Um, you talked about uh, CSR as part of your business model. CSR is deeply embedded in many companies. Yes, it's a glossy thing. We can put it on brochures. We can make our companies look good. But it's deeply seated in the DNA of your company, clearly, our company, clearly. And it permeates what we do. So we really talk about it being everything, part of everything we do today. And it is about, it is about applying you know, what we do best to do it better. You know, sustainability, after all, has been around since for years and years. I mean, it really is just about continuous improvement. It goes back to, I think, 1980s, 84, in the Brundtland Commission, the UN, who defined it. Growth countries, we're global companies, we're looking at exactly the same growth companies. India, China, the BRIC country, India, China, Indonesia, um, Brazil. Uh, these are places where it's happening, and it's happening, and these people are jumping in terms of technology light years ahead of us, and we're coming in behind with our, our uh, strong multinational capabilities, and we have a real responsibility and role to play, but we're also capturing a lot of uh, uh, rising incomes, and so we can just ride that wave, and I think we all owe it to ourselves. That we in this country have challenges because we have to deal with how that, that population will um, consume more resources. Um, these are all common, common um, uh, to our business as well. Um, you talked about, I thought you, you're focused on your stakeholders and you broke them into three groups, children, uh, customer, or consumers and communities. I thought that was really, really interesting because it really said a lot about who your company is and I think we talk a lot about who are our stakeholders. Cargo talks a lot about, we're, we're the middle guy, classic middle guy, we're a B2B. <coughs> 
So we're serving customers like you, and I have some customers in the audience here. And so in many ways, our responsibility, and we're the classic middleman, our, our CEO often talks about having spears come at him this way and this way uh, behind him. Uh, but we have, you know, we have to look at corporate responsibility in many ways. There's sort of two broad ways. One, as a food company, we have a responsibility to feed, feed the world. Um, that's how we look at it. And we have to do that responsibly, because if we can't do it responsibly, we won't have the land to grow the food to feed the world. We also owe it to our customers to protect their brand. So we have to do it well, because it's really our customers that are on the front line. And the minute there's any kind of conflict in that supply chain, it's really our customers that take the first heat, and then they come looking for us uh, to help solve the problem. So we have a real challenge there. So a lot of overlap and a lot of similarities. I found it very interesting. Let me talk about market transformation. There is a major change going on uh, that we see all the time. And I will just describe my day, because I started my day on a phone call. It was a three-hour phone call with the Keystone Sustainable Ag Alliance. And they were deciding what they're going to do uh, in terms of going forward. The Keystone Sustainable Ag Alliance is a group of companies and NGOs and the commodity, large commodity producer groups that are looking at how to make agriculture more sustainable in the U.S. It consists of Cargills of the world, the Bungies of the world, but it also consists of General Mills, uh, Kellogg's, um, Syngenta, Monsanto. They were on a call this morning trying to think about where we go with this group, and it was all about market transformation and how to make sure that we move the metrics, but also move the supply chain. And a, a colleague from General Mills was on the phone talking about how many of the CPG companies are interested in market transformation because they want to be able to make assurances to their consumers that they know what's happening in their supply chain. So the General Mills of the world or the Hershey's of the world, again, looking down at the Cargill's of the world, the, the processors and the traders, in the world of what we're doing in those supply chains. And this is happening across the board. So on any one day, I spend my time on this call. This afternoon, I was, uh, had a visitor from LG, the electronics firm. They had been in New York all, all week at a conference of the Global Compact, UN Global Compact, World Business uh, Council for Sustainable Development, C uh, KPMG, and they've been talking about sustainability, and he was passing through town, had a contact at Cargo, wanted to meet with us to talk about CSR, because he has a company that he's responsible for figuring out the CSR for, 50 different businesses. How does a large global company like Cargill figure out how to set up a framework to help shepherd the CSR for all these companies? And I talked about your example with cell phones. Because he was saying, you know, what, what? And I said, I'm actually going downtown in 45 minutes. I got to get going, by the way, to hear about Kogoling. And he said, they would do more of that, but there isn't the infrastructure, satellite infrastructure, to do more cell phone kind of apps to deliver to smallholders. And then now I'm here. And, and there's two or three customers of ours in the audience. Um, my point is, this is happening all over the private sector and all over the business sector. And companies are exchanging best practices as best they can to try to get out in front of this. Cargill, too, has many partnerships. A few examples of what we're doing, not only in the cocoa sector, doing many of the similar kinds of things. We tag with you on some of our initiatives. We've spent over $5 million on initiatives done farmer schools in cocoa and on training farmers how to grow cocoa better for yield intensification. But we've also done in palm uh, and in soy and in cotton and in, co uh, in uh, sugar, joint roundtables led by World Wildlife Fund, uh, led by Unilever, led by Nestle, and we're part of these roundtables setting standards and criteria so we can help implement and promote better, more sustainable standards across supply chains. Cargo's trained was the first one to train 8,800 smallholder farmers in the palm oil sector in Indonesia, the first ones to be certified under the round table on sustainable palm. We trained, I, I believe the number is 25,000 cocoa farmers um, in Ghana and the Ivory Coast, and we're setting up similar programs in Vietnam and Indonesia to increase yields, because we too see that flat supply. And we can't count on the Ivory Coast, given its uh, instabilities. In soy, the Amazon, we put a, a, a uh, going back to activists <laughs> and why these things move. This is my final story. Seven years ago, Cargill uh, decided that in order to move soybeans faster from uh, Brazil 
to Europe, we decided to put an export facility in the middle of the Amazon um, because our business in Brazil thought it was absolutely the right thing to do and actually commercially it made a lot of sense. But it was in the middle of the Amazon and Cargill was seen as a magnet for what was already happening in the Amazon which was dramatic deforestation as a result of migrations of people going in there to set up agriculture, whether it was for livestock or for soy farms. Um, and, and that we became a magnet for Greenpeace as well. Well, it was for soybeans that was being used for this export facility. Soybeans go into the feed mill for poultry. Poultry is what chicken McNuggets are made in, in, um, in Europe. So Greenpeace went and protested at McDonald's that the soybeans that were feeding the poultry were coming from the Amazon and deforesting the Amazon. What flared up was actually the creation of a very good thing, a coalition that was formed where Cargill, working with McDonald's, working with WWF, working with Greenpeace, created a soy moratorium and held back uh, and slowed down the rate of deforestation as a result of it. We continue to work on standards for soy from Brazil. Um, and we continue today to drive the partnership that we have with the TNC there where we work with farmers again to monitor using GPS technology, to monitor the farms, to monitor their compliance with the forest code and to help them uh, mitigate and, uh, and uh, uh, reforest some areas where they actually had already deforested. So this is happening all over in many of our supply chains and across many businesses. It's very exciting. It's going to have an impact certainly on all of us as consumers. The biggest challenge going forward is someone has to pay for this because there are things you have to do to set up systems and there's a debate going on across the supply chain about whether farmers feel that heat, whether we the, the, we the middle guys feel the heat to help pay for those costs or the end consumer pays for those costs. And these are the struggles that are being worked through today because in order to build these assurances into the system, in order to increase um, the productivity and increase assurance in these people will have to improve systems, improve technology, improve knowledge and awareness. And so it's still working its way through to figure out how these commodities, these sustainable commodities that we want, will be paid for, but eventually they will become the commodity of future, I'm sure. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for making remarks before me and leaving me with nothing to say. Um, you might wonder what an academic has to contribute to this conversation after all these good practical stories, and I'm wondering that myself. Um, when David invited me onto the panel, he said, play the role of the angry academic who will make Andy wish that he'd never traveled for an early Minnesota spring. So, um, no, he didn't really ask me to do that, and I'm not going to do that because I'm not an ag angry academic, and in fact, um, I think that um, this area is one area in which um, there have been incredible cross-sector partnerships, not only between academics and non-academics, but between uh, corporates and non-corporates with regard to making the world a better place. And I think it's just eye-opening in the first place to see that there are businesses that don't see profit as the sole purpose of business, but rather um, that see what, um, what Michael Porter has called a shared value approach, where Profit is a purpose, but social benefit is another purpose as a viable way in which to do business and a sustainable way in which to do business. Um, just to prove to you that I'm not an angry academic, I will tell you, um, using Hershey's syrup, I made chocolate malts for my children for dinner last night. Um, I did put bananas in them, and they drank a little less as a result. But... Um, I'm going to come back to that point because, um, as one of my colleagues remarked the other day, one of the really interesting things about the um, cocoa chocolate industry is that there are, um, there are ethical issues at both ends of the value chain. Um, and he talked a lot about the uh, supply end of the value chain and the labor and environmental issues there. But there's also an issue on the consumption side with regard to um, the health and wellness um, impacts of a, uh, an enjoyable but indulgent treat. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that momentarily, but first I just want to couch my remarks in terms of a really wonky academic topic, which is what is um, corporate responsibility and why do we seek non-market solutions to non-market, to, to market-based problems? So Andy had a nice graphic in which um, he demonstrated that in theory, if yield goes up, then social conditions for the um, farmers go up, and if those go up, then the reputation of the company is enhanced, and um, it's sort of a virtuous circle. And Jim um, raised some realistic questions about whether that virtuous circle always works perfectly, and um, Andy and Jim both remarked that it doesn't work perfectly, and that's why we do seek non-market solutions to market um, problems. If the market worked perfectly, then we would all be ethical consumers. How many of you are ethical consumers? Now, before you raise your hand, let me define what an ethical consumer is. <laughs> I know you all think you're ethical, but an ethical consumer will actually make decisions on which brand to choose based upon what they know about the company's ethics or what they think they know about the company's ethics. And so if they've read an article about a concern about supply chain, um, an ethical concern about supply chain, they may choose another brand as a result of that concern. Or they might even um, do some research before they choose what brand. So how many of you are ethical consumers in that context? Okay, a few of you, but a minority of you. And that's probably um, about a realistic picture of what the whole consumer base so is. So if we wait for the market to resolve these questions, we'll wait a long time because not everybody is making deliberate ethical choices about which brands they choose. Another question, how many of you are social investors? A social investor, similar to an ethical consumer, will a, a social investor will even read companies' sustainability reports, for example. They'll read independent analyst reports of companies' corporate social responsibility in making investing decisions. How many of you are social investors in that regard? Okay, a slightly smaller proportion, and, and that's what I would expect as well. So even though a perfectly efficient market should be a market in, with, in which social responsibility creates shared value, value for society as well as value for the investor, um, we don't live in a perfectly efficient market, which is why we need to pursue these non-market solutions, because there is injustice today, there is suffering today, um, and there are opportunities today to make um, lives better. Um, another interesting issue I think that Andy's presentation uh, raised, and, and Mark actually figures in this story as well, is that um, there's a question as to how much responsibility should a company actually take for the actions of its suppliers. So. If, for example, there's child labor in the supply chain, but Hershey doesn't own those farms, and Cargill doesn't own those farms, then is it really their responsibility? And I think what these companies are saying is, yes, it's our responsibility because there are issues today, and there's something that we have the power to do um, something um, good for today, and, by the way, because there are some ethical consumers and social investors, it might actually come back to bite us, the big brands, before it comes back to bite um, some less known um, names and brands. So um, there's this space between um, the pure free market and um, a much more constrained market where I think corporate responsibility operates and should operate. And I think we're still in the early phases of figuring out exactly what it means to create shared value and to be part of that shared value equation. But especially for the students in the room, I'd just like to emphasize why there are non-market solutions to market problems. Um, Ron also mentioned that I have an advisor background, so I just want to share a story. And ironically, um, if I didn't make your hair stand on end with my academic perspective, I might make um, Mark's and Andy's hair stand on end a little bit when I um, compare cocoa to tobacco. And in doing so, I'm, I'm doing so, take it, take it with a grain of salt. Um, well, there's another commodity. 
Um, <laughs> I didn't intend that, but um, I'm not suggesting that cocoa is bad in the way that tobacco is bad. After all, as I told you, I, I fed my three children. I think Hershey's syrup is actually not real cocoa, is it? It's not the real stuff, but I, I do feed my children the real stuff. Um, and um, so I, I, I don't give them cigarettes, however. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think that we all have something to learn from the tobacco story with regard to. By the way, I, I once compared sugary soda to tobacco with a new client that worked for a sugary soda company and almost became an old client in an instant. Um, <laughs> but I explained myself as I'm trying to explain to you as well. Um, I think a lot of products are starting to get the tobacco treatment. And what the tobacco treatment is, is um, concern from social advocates around, for example, health and wellness issues in particular, and whether, for example, these products should be marketed to children or other vulnerable populations, or if they should be available for sale um, near children or to children. So um, some products that don't meet certain health standards have been in recent years pulled out of schools, sometimes voluntarily and sometimes um, by regulatory fiat. Um, and although I don't think cocoa is tobacco, one thing to be learned from the tobacco experience is this. Um, I would say tobacco is, is vilified by many today for a couple of key reasons. Um, one reason is that it's ostensibly bad for you. And um, this alone might be mitigated in some cases by the fact that like chocolate, tobacco provides a lot of pleasure for some people. Um, I'm not a smoker myself, but I have known smokers who, aside from the, the good feeling that, um, that nicotine might give them, they truly enjoy the taste of tobacco. It's an art in a way to them. It's something really to be considered among the pleasures of life. I've known people who are in research and development in tobacco companies, and their search is for the perfect tasting cigarette. Regardless of what the other effects are, they're willing to put up with some of the negative impacts. And let's all say, you know, an overindulgence in chocolate wouldn't be necessarily healthy for um, a person, but I think most of us can agree, hopefully all of us can agree, that um, we're excited for that 25-pound box of Hershey's Kisses, <laughs> because it's one of the pleasures in life. Um, what really got tobacco in trouble is this. It's um, a systematic denial of, of good science and a perceived exploitation of an uninformed consumer. So tobacco probably could have gotten by the it's not so good for you piece of this, but with that systematic denial of good science, essentially what tobacco was doing was covering up the, um, the facts that consumers would need in order to make good decisions. And as Sharon Watkins, the Enron whistleblower said, it's the cover-up that gets a lot of smart people, and even not so smart people have said this, um, and they're all right. It's the cover-up that really gets you into trouble, not necessarily the, the initial crime. Um, and that's why it's so good to see that um, this non-tobacco industry is seeking to be transparent, seeking to inform and be proactive and be a force for good in a context when the pursuit of profit can sometimes um, lead in the wrong direction. So thanks for the opportunity to make some comments, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion. Okay, we have a couple of microphones. We'd like to welcome questions that you might have. Uh, please wait for a microphone. We are recording the session, and uh, we want to make sure we've picked up your question. Do we have questions, please? Here's one right here. Yeah, thank you very much to, to all of you for your comments. First, a general question for all of you. Could you say a bit more about the, the true business case for sustainability? You talked about that a bit already. But can you say more about why, for example, and the sustainability of the core of this process? And my, my second question is specifically for you, Andy, and the Hershey Corporation. 
Uh, could you talk more about transparency, specifically around child labor and slave labor, and what Hershey's steps have been and what they are to uh, reduce, reduce that in terms of uh, local production? Thank you. Um, I, I, <laughs> I better start uh, with a little uh, uh, comment on the, on the previous. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just what's interesting, actually, is uh, that there's a lot of uh, really interesting data coming out on, on, on chocolate and heart benefits. And you see that in dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you might start seeing that on milk chocolate. And uh, I will now go back to the question. <laughs> uh, let me talk with the, the child labor. The, ch the, the comments earlier really, really actually uh, I, I want to be direct here, and it probably won't be all that popular, but I, I find the whole debate about child labor quite strange. It, it, is, a, it is an African issue. It is, um, it is cultural. It's going to be solved by the Africans. Um, uh, we, as a business, participate in the business, and we have an obligation. So we, the, the, but I, I don't think it really is going to be solved by uh, Western firms, however smart, well-intentioned. Uh, we, we have a, a supportive role to play, and we will, not, um, we will not have a supply chain that is marked by child labor as, as a business. But I, I do think people from outside the region really um, uh, uh, impose views, standards, et cetera, that, that um, the Africans um, ultimately, you're going to have to resolve this. So I just I do think that's important to say. Specifically for us, um, we have a, a, the International Cocoa Initiative, which is an NGO, half NGO and half for business, um, sp devoted to identification, understanding of child labor. They've been at it about eight years. Um, they're based in Geneva. They have about five people in the field in West Africa. Progress has been slow. There has been some progress. Um, they report out through the Harkin Angle protocol. Uh, Senator Harkin and Congressman Angle uh, set up a, a framework protocol. I think the most significant thing that's happened lately is about a year ago, there's a seven, $10 million from the US government and $7 million private side contribution. So $17 million to bring down child labor uh, by 70% in Ghana and the Ivory Coast by 2020. Now, will they make it? I don't know. Um, but uh, we're, we're there. I think Cargill's part of that. Uh, we, don't, we, we see that uh, multinational is working with the Department of Labor uh, and the Europeans being positive uh, as a positive step. But I, I really do think it's going to be the Ghanaian government, the Ivorian governments, who ultimately are going to understand, solve, and address the problem. So, you know, it's it's uh, has to be understood within the African context. On sustainability, for us, um, you know, um, it's not. It's both very difficult and very straightforward. It's good business. It's good business practice. We we're building a a, a major three hundred million dollar plant in Pennsylvania. And um, uh, we're going to have zero waste to landfill. So, you know, that we probably wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have done that 10 years ago. I don't know what the savings of that will be, but there'll be at least five or ten million dollars, I would estimate. Um, but it's a. Um, I think it's more strategic, and sustainability actually really relates to to human resources. That's a, a lot of how we think about it, which is. The way that we uh, recruit, retain, develop people, we, we want the best people. And, and we want to have practices that bring them to the company and have them stay, because churn does, hurts us. So we really actually probably see it more on that side than anything else. Jim, did you have a comment? And yeah. I I mean, first of all, I appreciate you sticking up for chocolate's health benefits. Um, <laughs> if people overindulge in chocolate, though, um, you know, tobacco is a, a appetite suppressant. So, in fact, you know, both products have health benefits that you could play off against each other in a, in a really beneficial way. some red wine, too. And, or maybe add some red wine. <laughs> or Red Bull, which is a health drink. Um, of course.
corporate social responsibility for me, the problem is there isn't a very good business case for corporate social responsibility the way the economy is currently structured, especially with the degree of financialization we have in the economy. And so that's why we need civil society, that's why we need government, um, that's why we need other sources of power in society like workers or farmers to counteract the, the lack of corporate social responsibility that we sometimes see. But, uh, but having said that, um, in, especially in my work at WWF with some of the l large corporations, some surprising sources of the business case for me were, first of all, uh, your own staff. That people want to work at companies where they feel good about what the company's doing. And in today's labor market, you know, th it's a real problem if you can't recruit top talent. And part of what makes a company attractive is the sense that they're doing the right thing. The other thing is, and this kind of gets back to all those cell phones people are running around with in, in Ghana, the degree of information flow today in the world uh, means that if you're a publicly traded company and you screw up, people are going to find out about it and it's going to affect your share price. And so I know those sound like sort of defensive uh, uh, things, but for me those were sort of surprising and in many cases quite powerful arguments for why corporations should be quite responsible. Here's another question, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for your comments. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. I um, wrestle with a lot of these issues that you're talking about as a business consultant and one that's passionate about sustainability. And I recognize how challenging it must be in, uh, to work within a traditional business model constrained by federal regulations which require uh, for public companies uh, profits to go exclusively for uh, profit to go exclusively f to the company and the stakeholders and any other funds directed uh, in such a way uh, are seen as um, not endorsed at least uh, legally by our, our federal laws and with that though back to the, the idea of who's going to pay for uh, sustainable business practices um, the, I thought where uh, uh, Dr. Michelson was going to go with the externalities uh, argument and cigarettes was um, the lawsuits that the states have uh, won with regard to the consequences on, on the public health with regard to smoking. And all business has externalized consequences for the use, production, and supply chain of their, of their products and or services. And so it's curious and challenging for me in, in having the conversation about sustainability within business is often the products and services, end of life and after life, uh, and or the consequences of using the product itself are externalized to the greater good, the public. And so therefore governments are responsible often for the consequences of the use of product. And I'm wondering how within, that, within the walls of your respective corporations, um, the, the two of you at Hershey's as well as Cargill, are having that conversation, and how does that relate to sustainability? Um, a little, I, I was going to share this, and it, it's 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 what everybody else has said. But um, uh, Ken Ken Goodpasture's brother uh, works at Hershey, Bob Goodpasture, and Bob's got this job called uh, Consumer Insights, and um, basically does a deep dive on consumer sentiment, attitudes, and whatnot. Um, and about every three or four years, they do a major study uh, called our global <coughs> global trend study. And um, so they look out ten years, and they they find things like uh, uh, rapid urbanization that that people are the cities are getting going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger. Um, but what they also found in my area was what they call the giving back uh, that 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 this idea of CSR or people feeling like companies and products have responsibility to the greater good. It's pretty much universal. It's expressed differently, but we see it everywhere and we see it as a very powerful trend. So the very straightforward answer from us would be that if we miss that trend, we're irrelevant and we don't want to miss that trend. So uh, we also see data that says 70% of the U.S. consumer today if they know price and quality are the same and they know a little bit about the brand that they like, they'll pick that one. Uh, and, they, and, they, and it's about 90% if it's negative. So a, a Toyota or a BP in, in recent memory shows how quickly it... So 
We're very aware of that, and I think that's how we kind of um, rationalize it. Go ahead. There's, there, is, uh, there is no clear business case, um, and we've sliced and diced it every way you can. And I think one of the challenges about sustainability is that a lot of people look at it as an ends in itself. It is an ends. It's continuous improvement. It was with us 20 years ago. It will be with us 20 years from now. Um, it's a way of approaching business. It's a way of self-improvement. And, and so you can look at this and say, yes, it will differentiate us with new employees and employees that want to work for companies that have the right values. Uh, yes, it will help us. Uh, if we're responsible in a community, it will help us with the public official who's making a decision on a regulatory issue, blah, blah, blah. Yes. If we make a really, really green product that's affordable and economic, it's a it's a it's a home run, right? But often green products have come with other costs, and so you have to absorb those costs and find ways to do it. Um, we have just started a product, uh, pro, uh, a project in Cargo to look at the buying process for our customers on sustainability, because there are many customers. We have some of them that are the biggest advocates for sustainability in the world today that you see and read about in the media today. But if we go and bend over backwards to create a sustainable process or solution for them, they won't pay for it. <laughs> um, they won't buy more widgets from us. So, you know, you got to look at the buying process too. Who is making the buying decision and will they pay for it? So it's really got to, you got to do it because it's either the right thing to do, and there are some people, someone mentioned, it's just the right thing to do and you just bend over and go and do it. Um, and there's some people that will say, I'll do it, but it's going to cost me more money, and if I don't do it, it isn't profitable, and then I'm not a sustainable business. So it's really, it's a mindset, and you got to bring the whole mindset in, and you got to look at it. On the sustainable environmental side, it's eco-efficiency. If it makes more sense to turn them, you know, to turn your thermostat down and you save more money, you do it. Is that sustainable? No, it's just good economics. Um, so it's really a mindset. It's not an end. And I think often we get too fixated on, oh, if I go help my community tomorrow, then I'm sustainable. No, you're helping your community tomorrow, but what are you going to do the next day? Yeah. Well, it's more expensive, yes, but the costs right now are being borne by taxpayers for products, the harm the products go to the general public. We're at um, just about at six, but there was one more question that wanted to come out. We will have time in the reception if you want to continue the conversation, but we want to respect closing time for everybody. So if we could have the one last question, please. I'd like to ask a question about product sustainability and both for market, Cargill and EMD at Hershey. I wanted to say that, you know, when companies launch sustainable products, you know, they start at zero as far as market share versus traditional products, I wanted to gauge where you guys were at with the Rainforest Online certified products at Hershey and then some of the sustainable commodities at Target. Um, so we have we have we have a, a brand Dagoba, a premium brand that's had some certification for the last two or three years, but it it's a pretty small brand, wonderful brand, but um, I think uh, the current number that I have is that about one to two percent right now of U.S. market cocoa is certified. Um, on the other hand, it, that segment has grown by about fifty percent. So it's it's small, but it is growing. Um, it's a ma it's it's a much bigger mar uh, market force in Northern Europe. So uh, the numbers are much higher there. Not so much in the U.S. Growing in Canada. Um, so for us, uh, I think the rainforest does a couple things. One, as, as was said earlier, it, it, it's a way of making permanent some of the sustainability measures um, and, and showing the farmers the requirements to, to get a, a premium price uh, through the cooperative. And then um, there's some really interesting sort of side benefits, one of which is that the Rainforest Alliance has a global climate change is happening in West Africa is happening in the cocoa uh, region and it's it could be quite serious in the next five or ten years. So they're one of the things they do is they have uh, cocoa varieties that are more uh, warm climate or uh, drought resistant and so they can plant that. So 
I do think it, we haven't spoken, we've mostly spoken about the labor side of it. I do think the environmental side of it will be equally important uh, in the certification side. Uh, slightly similar story, we have, we have an OOT certified um, uh, sustainable uh, cocoa product that we sell mostly in Europe um, that, and these numbers are going to be slightly off, I was told, I think just about six months ago, that the BU thought that they were generating, I want to say, something like 5 to 15 percent of their, their uh, revenues currently, and they were hoping that in five years that would be 40 percent. Uh, the product that's been out now two or three years is generating something along the lines of uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars, I think, in premiums that get put back into the, you know, 10,000 farmers that are involved in the, uh, in the, uh, the production of it. Those numbers may be a little off, but I'm trying to give you a sense of scale and scope. With uh, sustainable palm oil, which is we're, we're getting into now, um, there is about 44 million tons of, of palm oil traded on the markets today. Sustainable palm oil, that is about 5 million today. A year and a half of this go was maybe 3.5 million. Of the 5 million, and this is not just cargo, this is global supply. Of the 5 million, um, tons that are that are out there and available today to be bought in the market. The market has not bought has only bought about three and a half million of them. So you're leaving sustainable product on the cutting room floor essentially, and it will eventually be sold as regular commodity because the market is not picking it up. People are unwilling to pay the added slight premium on it for for sustainable palm oil. And until that gets circulating and the flywheel gets moving it may send the message, the wrong message, back into the producers who produce it, smallholder producers and large-scale producers who are, you know, getting geared up to produce it and they're getting a wrong message from the supply chain. And we're working very hard to keep driving that forward and moving that number up, and that's part of the industry effort to do that. I think one of the, the clear message we've been getting from all of our, our speaker and, and our panel is that this is a journey and one that requires continuous effort and continuous progress and innovation along the way. Uh, I want to thank our speaker and thank our panelists for the absolutely fine job that they've done today. Uh, we'd also like to share with them a, a token of our appreciation. I'll give this one to Andy. We have ones for our other uh, panelists as well. Um, I didn't get to do the commercial on the center earlier, but I'll invite you to go on our website and take a look at what we do and how we do it. Uh, and to be in touch with us in terms of feedback that you may have uh, about this program and ideas for other ones. We're, we're always trying to listen as well as, as Andy's uh, story about what you learn when you listen. So we're, we're appreciative of that.